something like that. You see, we can study about children dying in Vietnam and that becomes an interesting problem of, um, of uh, what happens when plant growth is destroyed. An interesting issue. And it becomes an interesting issue. No pain, no suffering, no problem, no crisis for us, for you. You can study about poor people in the city who live their whole lives and never see a doctor, and you can study that as an interesting problem of, um, of, of what's the word they use now, of delivery of health care services. You see, it becomes very mechanical and abstract, and it doesn't hurt. And I'd like to read you something which hurts, at least it hurt me. It's just something I went through. And I'll just show you what, what, I, what I think is missing from public school and what will never be there as long as the power remains in, in the present hand. This is just an example. It's ha something happened to me a couple of years ago. A child on Blue Hill Avenue in Boston. Blue Hill Avenue is our, is our uh, Harlem. It's the heart of our ghetto. Ch a child on Blue Hill Avenue in Boston, 1965. She's an epileptic child. Epileptic. But her sickness has either never been diagnosed or else, more likely, it has been diagnosed but never treated. This is what usually happens. Poor people usually get to see a doctor, but in, the doctor tells them what's wrong with them <laughs> and then dismisses them. <laughs> That's it. It's a diagnosis and dismissal. And it doesn't get any further. There's no time. All right. Tall and thin, this little girl, 14 years old. She is intense and somber, devastated, but somehow unhating. One night, she comes downstairs into the office where I work, within the coat room, underneath the church stairs of a freedom school. Uh, well, I describe it geographically in the middle of Roxbury. Closing the door and sitting down upon the cold cement, she does this. She lays her head within my arms and tells me that she's going to have an epileptic uh, attack. She starts to shudder violently and moves about so I can scarcely protect her racked and thin young body from the cement wall and from the concrete floor. And seeing her mouth, this is me now, seeing her mouth writhe up with pain and spittle and feeling her thrash about a second time and now a third, three times. And in between the terror closing in upon her as in a child's bad dream that you can't get out of and watching her then and wondering what she undergoes and later, seeing her exhausted, sleeping there right in my arms, as at the end of long ordeal, all passion in her spent. Then taking her out into my car and driving with her to the city hospital, while she, as epileptics almost always feel, keeps saying that she is going to have another seizure, and anticipate it, and slamming the brakes and walking with her into the back door where they receive outpatient cases and being confronted on this winter night at 9 p.m. in Boston in the year of 1965 with a scene that comes out of Dante's Purgatory. Dozens and dozens of poor white, black, and Puerto Rican people, infants and mothers, old men, alcoholics, men with hands wrapped up in gauze, and aged people trembling, infants trembling with fever, one hostile woman in white uniform behind the table telling us out of a face made as it seems from clay that we should fill an application out, some sort of form, a small white sheet, then sit out in the hallway since the waiting room was crowded. And then to try to say to her that this child has just had several epileptic seizures in a row and needs, and, and, and needs immediate treatment. And do we need to do the form? And yes, of course you need to do the form and wait your turn and not think you have any special right to come ahead of anybody else. Two hours and four seizures later, you get up and you go in and you shout in her cold eyes and walk right by and grab an intern by the arm and tell him to come out and be a doctor to an epileptic child sitting like a damp rag in the hallway. 
and he comes out. And in two minutes, he gives this child an injection that arrests the seizures and sedates her. It writes the script, the prescription for more Dilantin and for phenobarbital, and shakes his head and says to you that it's a goddamn shame. Nobody, nobody, he says, nobody needs to have an epileptic seizure in this day and age. Nobody but a poor black nigger, says the intern in a sudden instant of that rage that truth and decency create. He nearly cries, and in his eyes you see a kind of burning pain that tells you that he is a good man somehow, deep down someplace where it isn't all cold stone, clean surgery and antiseptic reason. Nobody, he says, but a poor black nigger has to have an epileptic seizure anymore. So you take her home, and you go back down to the church, down to your office underneath the stairs, and you look at the floor, and you listen to the silence, and you are 28 years old, and you begin to cry. You cry for horror of what that young girl has just been through, and you long not to believe that this can be the city that you really live in. You fight very hard to shut off that idea because it threatens all the things that you have wanted to believe for so long. So you sit alone a while, and you try to reconstruct the inner architecture of your school-created self-control. You try to sterilize your anger and to organize and decontaminate your rage, but you just can't do it this time. You can't build that barrier of organized control a second time. It's 11 o'clock. And soon it's quarter twelve, and it's cold as stone down there beneath the wooden underside of the church stairs, and still you can't stop trembling from rage. Grand mal, it's the name for epilepsy of that kind, you think to yourself, means a great evil. It's 12.15, and now you're no longer crying, so you get up, and you lock the door of the coat closet, which is the office of a freedom school underneath the stairs, and you go upstairs, and you turn out the light, and then you close the door. Well, I wanted to read that to you just because it comes out of my life and because it points up to me so bitterly so what's missing and what will never be admitted into the confines of a public school as long as, as, long as the, the school continues to, to maintain this primary function of indoctrination. This crazy thing, sometimes a you know, the doctor, I was, I was describing this to a doctor. Imagine this now. I wasn't describing this to an architect, you see. I wasn't describing this to a fisherman. It wasn't a physicist, a chemist, or a plumber. He was a doctor. And what is more, he was a brain specialist. And I was sitting in his car talking about it with him. This is what's amazing, you see. And we're sitting in the car, and... and He's driving me home, dropping me off after a meeting, and he and he says to me, he says to me, uh, wh I describe the event. And he says, "Isn't that a goddamn shame? You'd think somebody could do something about it." <laughs> you see, he he's he's a neurologist, a specialist. That's what I wrote down about him when I got home. He lives ten miles west of Boston in a home that cost him eighty thousand dollars. $80,000. He spends $10,000 every year on university tuition for his children. 4000 for his wife and for himself to go to Curacao and to St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands every winter. Wears an inch thick block of gold watch. It's an inch thick. You know, like a big chunk of chocolate. Big thick thing, a big block of gold on his wrist. Costs $700. His coat cost 400 and he drives a black Mercedes-Benz that cost 8000 In the middle of the ghetto, he stops the car before he drops me off, and he gestures left and right into the boarded buildings and the empty, em devastated empty lots and skinny kids out in the sidewalk with the whores and hustlers and the hostile-looking cops. Isn't that a goddamn shame? Look at that, he says to me. Isn't that a shame? You'd think that somebody could do something about it. <laughs> you see, and that's, and that's what school creates.
That's the whole point. We create somebody like him, and then we don't have to. Then we don't. You believe that you don't need to do anything, do you? You're safe. Okay. Well, I'm almost done. I'm just going to make a few more points. One of the problems, maybe this will be the culminating point, because I'd like to have some questions. I guess you have to have dinner sometime. Um, one of the sort of problems that schools face, public schools, is that although schooling is itself an aesthetic, anti-ethical, super patriotic, anti-passionate, and anti-just, we've got this funny problem that in the United States we have a lot of heroes who are good men. We've got all these revolutionary heroes, you see, like Dr. King and Malcolm and like, uh, well, not really revolutionary, but eloquent people like Bobby Kennedy and then in earlier days, men like Garrison and Thoreau and from other nations, people like Gandhi so forth in St. Francis. As you can probably tell, I, I, I find Gandhi and St. Francis very attractive heroes to me. St. Francis was one of the great revolutionaries, you know. When that word gets out and people begin to read what St. Francis said, a lot of churches are going to change their names. No, he was a, he was a passionate revolutionary. And, um, and so what happens, that what the school does is it has a very funny way of dealing with it. It sort of takes somebody like, it takes someone like, like, well, let's take someone recent like Dr. King. It's easier, I guess. And the school says, yes, he's a good man. He's a very good man, a great man indeed. Um, and yet the school has a way of glazing him over, almost like shellacking him, turning him into a statue in our mind so that we don't feel that any of us stands in direct, confrontation with him. We turn, the school turns him into a kind of character who cannot speak to us directly. This is essentially what happens. So that he becomes a good man who believed in God, obeyed the law most of the time, um, obviously an attractive Negro since he's rather light-skinned and moderate in his ways, and, and therefore somebody we can study about. And we don't tell children, of course, th that, he, that, he, that his mandate to his people and to us was to break the law if the law is not just. And we go to somebody like Gandhi, and we study Gandhi as sort of an interesting man who believed in weaving and home weaving and, um, and had interesting dietary customs and so forth. And we don't tell the children that Gandhi believed in civil disobedience. You see, we don't tell them that he told us that we should break the law when the law is unjust. And by, by definition, uh, essentially any good hero is a dead hero. It's somebody who's dead, who can't, who can't come into the school all of a sudden and, and, and contradict the teacher, you see. We don't do that with Eldridge Cleaver and we don't do it with Cesar Chavez. Once they're dead, we will because they'd be safe. But I think this is a very, because then, then, they then there's no danger of intrusion. But I think it's very bitter because what happens is the children, we learn to feel that there's sort of an, ins an that there's, there's an, an endless gulf between any of us, any one of us, and the men that we most love. So we learn to sort of think in school that there are two kinds of people in the world. There are great men who lived at another age always and are now dead, and they did certain good things. And then there are ordinary people, ordinary people such as you and me, and we do regular things. Dr. King went to the mountains, but we stay on the flatlands, you see. We do not go to the mountains. If we went to the mountains, what would we do? Could we c how could we come back and, and feel at ease in, in the college dormitory, you see? What would we say when we went back home for Passover or Easter, you know, is the thing. So we have this sort of thing where the school incorporates, it's again Marcuse's repressive tolerance, the school incorporates all the great men. You read all the stuff, you can read it all. You read Thoreau. Thoreau was very interesting. He was a naturalist, right? Believed in, that it was nice to live in the woods and uh, be, fr be, be on good terms with the squirrels and the raccoons and plant bean seeds. See, we don't, we don't enable children to feel that Thoreau is a living mandate 
now burning in the air, right there in front of you, looking into your eyes and saying to you, like in 1832, 1842, whenever it is, I looked at my nation seizing land from Mexico, enslaving black people, I break the law. You live in 1971, what are you doing, you see? It's the moment when this happens, when we feel that we're in a direct discipleship, a dialogue of equals, or of disciple and master with a great man is, a, is enormous danger to this society. So the school has to learn how to defuse the danger of a man like Thoreau how to defuse, emasculate, castrate the, the passion and the provocation of a man like Dr. King, and it does it very well. Okay, well, uh, the obvious answer at this point, and the one that will get thrown at me when I'm done, if I don't get to it myself, is, so what? <laughs> so what are you saying? This is the norm uh, traditional question. Uh, you're saying then that schools indoctrinate children Schools serve the flag and therefore do not serve the cause of justice. This is what I'm saying, indeed. I'm saying a school that, school that serves the primary goal of preparing obedient citizens cannot serve the function of educating decent people. If this is the case, then what are you suggesting? You suggest we go in and bomb all the schools? You suggest we go and blow them up? Shoot the teachers? Well, um, no, <laughs> not suggesting that. And I, mean, I didn't really mean my hesitation to imply that either. Uh, certain these tapes get make find their way to the Justice Department fairly quickly. I'd like to come back to Iowa next year again. Um, but I'm not suggesting that in any case, because I, I happen to be one of those square, old-fashioned people who do not believe in violence. Um, if, it can, if there's any way in which it can be avoided. But what I am saying is that there has got to be a strong, insightful, non-naive, non-innocent sense of leverage on what's really going on in public schools. And if we're going to talk about what is to be done with the school, what can happen in this school, how can we change it, we've got to raise the dialogue about 20 miles and get way beyond the present conversation, which has to do with mild innovations, a little bit more Negro history, a little bit more freedom in the classroom, open campus, let the kids go out for one semester and interview the garbage man and the mayor, um, let the kids do a little bit of free work, let them talk a little bit more in class, unscrew the chairs and throw carpets on the floor. This isn't going to deal with the problem. It will be very easy for the society to, to create innovative methods of indoctrination, <laughs> just as well as traditional and boring methods. In fact, the big corporations are very busy working on this right now. Instead of a single teacher selling us on patriotic chauvinism and the willingness to kill anyone who looks different from us and smells different and thinks different, instead of a teacher selling it to us, next year it's going to come out of a beautiful gadget sent into our classroom by IBM or SRA. Do you ever see those SRA kits or Xerox or Time Incorporated or the Reader's Digest, uh, Westinghouse, GM? All the big corporations are getting into this now. Instead of having individual, instead of having direct class indoctrination, we're going to have individualized indoctrination. That everyone will be indoctrinated at their own pace and at their own free will, you see. And it will have innovative chauvinism instead of the old-fashioned kind. We will have a total option, wide open freedom to choose 20 different varieties of cold self-interest <laughs> instead of um, one standard fare that is sold to the entire class. It seems to me the issues and the argument have got to be escalated enormously. The real question is not how can we make the pill a little more sweet, but how can we change the pill? How can we get a different kind of thing going on? And this implies two, my opinion implies two parallel strategies taking place at the same time. I see no way to, to avoid this. Number one strategy is for people who have the guts and have the nerve and have the courage to go into public schools, to labor within the school system, to survive as long as they can, but to do this 
in a consciously subversive state of mind. And I'm sure this isn't the sort of thing which goes over big in the middle of, of the heartland of America, but I just have got to be faithful to my own beliefs. It would be very easy for me to, you know, I know the game. It would be very easy for me to come out here and entertain you with a nice liberal speech. And I'm just, I'm just not going to do it because then I go back to Boston and feel like a hypocrite. Uh, the fact of the matter is, in my opinion, there is no way to be a good teacher to children unless you are willing to be disloyal to the flag that stands above the doorway. I see no other way to do it. I see no way to do it. Does not mean, does not mean, does not mean we, I, I just, my temperament and my beliefs does not mean we, are go we, we go in and we try to manipulate children and sell them on Marxist slogans. I don't think that's good teaching. Does not mean we go in and stir them up and, and in induce them to commit acts of violence. Does not mean we go in and assist them in designing bombs. But it does mean that we go in and raise the kinds of issues which cannot be tucked away into an easy category, which cannot be tucked away into an abstract outline. If we are dealing with the children of the men who engineered the war in Vietnam, then our obligation as teachers is to send those kids home crying. That is the point. We have got to get kids to go home and to force the issue at the dinner table, whether it's racism, whether it's Vietnam, whether the issue is the smallest type of oppression which takes place in the local neighborhood, the local school. The children have got to be forced to the point or allowed to get to the point, which they don't need to force it. If you open it up, it will be there. They've got to be allowed to get to the point where they have access to their own conscience. And if this happens, it is going to cause trouble. There is no way to get around it. Principals are going to feel the heat. Superintendents are going to feel the heat. And school boards are going to want to get rid of us. And sooner or later, they probably will. It seems to me the first stage of the only viable strategy I know is to go into those schools, have the guts to go there, try to survive, Try to be decent. Try to be such a good teacher that they really don't want to fire you, you know? A lot of schools have such a hard time with kids. If you're just awful good, it's awful hard to fire you. Do it good. Be a good teacher. Get the kids to play the discipline game, but let them know what the discipline game is about, and let them share with you a cynical le sense of, of, of leverage as to what it's all about. Do it to get the principal off your neck or the school committee off your neck, and then fight like hell to undermine the kinds of things that I've been describing. And then the second part of the strategy, and this to me is the most important right now, is to recognize that if you do something like this, sooner or later, you're going to get in trouble. And not to think that it won't happen, and not to think that it shouldn't happen. Because one of the big myths of American education is that we can get something good for nothing. We can't. As, as, as Edmund says in King Lear, nothing comes out of nothing. If we're going to get a real change, we're going to have to put our bodies on the line. We have to be as good at it, as clever, as effective as possible. But sooner or later, we're going to get caught and we're going to get fired. We'll either get fired or we'll be forced to resign. And when it comes, don't be surprised. You know, the guy who commits civil disobedience shouldn't be surprised when they send him to jail. You know? <laughs> you go to David Rockefeller's townhouse in New York, and you insult him, you shouldn't be surprised that he doesn't invite you back. You know, this is the great myth in this country that we can say anything we want. We don't have to pay a price for it. We have to choose. When we choose, we stand on one side or the other. The people on the other side will not be happy. And we will get into trouble, and we will have to pay a price. And when we get fired, this is the real point. It doesn't need to be the end of our work in education. It doesn't need to be the end of our involvement with children because there's a big uh, movement forming in this country now. Started five years ago in the East, in New York City, in Boston, Philadelphia, and Washington. It swept across the country. There are 2,000 alternative schools in the United States today. There were three in 1965. 2,000 schools free schools, they're sometimes called community schools, storefront schools, alternative schools, people's schools, student-operated schools, and the best ones of all are, are not called schools. They just call them places to go, you know, trying to undo the word. We started a place in Boston last year called the storefront. We just didn't want to call it a school. 
a different word. And it's a huge movement. One of the great things that's happened, it's not just limited to rich people. It's not just limited to poor people. It's not just limited to militant blacks. It has swept the country. And it's an extraordinary thing that's happened. People, especially high school kids on their own, have been able to demythologize the idea of school so it no longer commands awe and terror and anxiety. It no longer seems to them like an amazing thing. A lot of people have suddenly discovered that you really don't need four years of, of, of a university education to learn how to teach geography to six-year-old children. They really don't need to get a degree in, um, in, in playing soccer, you know, and doing exercises. They don't really need to go, to s go through uh, 16 or 18 years of formal education of your own in order to learn how to sit with children and read books and talk and think and argue and invent. Of course, most of the people in question do have the credentials because we've all been through it in large part. The, boy, the sort of thing that's happening is young people getting together with a couple of teachers, six or eight teachers, six or eight parents, maybe a dozen kids, two dozen kids, and they're fighting issues in the high school, sometimes elementary school, then it wouldn't be the kids so much, it'd be the parents. They're fighting the issues, and suddenly the bubble bursts and somebody's fired. Maybe two or three people are fired or several kids are kicked out, and they go off on their own and they brew about it for a while, and they figure how they can get back in. And they figure, is there any way we can get back in? Or is there any other school we can go to? And they go and they, do it, they have interviews, and they try to get hired, and no one else wants to hire them. And suddenly what they say is, you know, all the time we're spending trying to find a school, it would be easier to start one. And so they're starting schools on their own. They're finding it doesn't take a lot of money, it doesn't take a lot of work, and it doesn't take a lot of time. It does take courage. This started first in, in, in the black community. Uh, at that time, it did take nerve because no one had done it yet. It was very odd. When we, when we started the first free school in Boston in 1966, 66, New School for Children was about the first. I was involved as a sort of a friend, advisor to the parents. It was an extraordinary feeling, uh, incredible, like that they were challenging the gods, like Prometheus taking, taking fire away from Mrs. Hicks, you know. And we were, and we, it's an amazing feeling, like, how could we do this? What have we got? Well, most of the parents hadn't been to college like you. You know, most of them, many hadn't even finished high school. Extraordinary thing. And just saying, well, let's just start a school. How do you start a school? What does it take? It takes children. It takes a place to do it. It takes things to read and write on. And it takes a building. Yeah, they went out and bought a building, a house, nice, lovely house, beautiful old house, all covered with ivy, looked like an old man with a beard. And hired four superb teachers out of the public school system, teachers who were about to quit or be fired, enrolled kids, held a big meeting. I remember that meeting. <laughs> Woman, Mrs. Walker, got up and said, well, we're going to start a school. That was a nice moment. And all the professors from the Harvard School of Education came over to that meeting, and they were very skeptical about it and said, what are you going to do for money? I remember that. They said, what are you going to do for money? And Mrs. Walker said, we're going to charge a dollar to everyone who comes to our meetings. Yeah, we had $200 there, this kind of thing. Amazing. It started, look, 12, 12 black parents, 12 black parents, one screwed up teacher, me, right, and my girlfriend, and about 20 friends went out in six months, bought a building that cost $80,000, no, $40,000, bought a building that cost $40,000, hired four teachers, rebuilt the building, hired a lawyer and got credentialized by the city, enrolled children, fought a legal battle against their opening, opened, turned down dozens of white kids who, from the suburbs who tried to get in because the school from the start had such a good reputation. They have a waiting list on white applicants. And I remember some professor from Brandeis called me up that fall and asked me if I had any pull. And I thought, man, times have changed, you know, and that could happen. And he called and said, if I had any pull to get his kid into black school in the middle of the ghetto. And the thing is, and then we went out, we raised the money, we found the way to get it, we gave talks. I went to all the Unitarian churches, they're always the ones that give money, they're not very much. They're always nice, but they're too poor. 
the trouble, Unitarians. And then I went to the Jewish synagogues, got a more, little more money there, and so forth. And we, we raised $80,000 that year. Mostly the parents did it themselves. 80000 bucks. Since that time, that school has raised probably close to a million dollars. And it's mushroom. There are now four schools like that in Boston. And as I say, there are 2,000 nationwide. If you're interested, none of you are probably going to hitch to Boston. There are a lot of schools like that in Chicago. And there are several in Milwaukee. In Milwaukee, there's a federation of about a dozen schools like that. But I've been talking too long. And since I don't believe in conventional lectures, obviously, and since I also don't believe in sort of staged performances, I'm not going to end with some sort of big, fantastic, amazing conclusion where I quote from Martin Luther King and bow and everyone cries. I'm just going to end on that note and say, if you think what I've said has any sense in it, if it's not a lot of shit, if it means anything to you, I hope that you'll be putting your, your body on the line the next, next year or two and seeing what you can do about it. If you do decide to do something about it, if you do stick out your neck, and if you do get into trouble, you're going to find a lot of people are going to stick with you including me and the guys that I work with. We've got a network set up now where we're keeping in touch with teachers all over the country. We're keeping correspondence with them. We're keeping cross-index on jobs and teachers, people who need jobs, people who have been fired, people who are starting schools, what kinds of schools. We've got contacts in Boston, New York, Washington, a lot of contacts out in the West Coast, and even a few in the middle of the country. If you're interested, you'll find that we'll stick with you and we won't ditch you. And, um, and if any of you do want to hitch as far as Boston, you'll have a place to stay. All right. If you would like to stay, uh, Mr. Kozal will take questions if you'd like to stay and talk with him. Just The question was about the Jenks, the Jenks proposal, the voucher scheme. Is anyone is that, is that well known around here? Well, the voucher idea is essentially that um, one one of the problems. What I was just describing is that school is, of course, a monopoly. It's a it's it, the money all tax raised money for education in the United States goes directly to the institution, right? It goes to the school or the school committee. It doesn't go to the individual. So we have no choice. Well, this was based, I guess, you know, early days on idealistic faith and trust in the public school system. But the, the voucher scheme proposal is essentially, I hate to talk through the mic because it makes it seem as though we're much further apart than we really are. But anyway, uh, the voucher scheme idea is that instead of giving the money to the school, we give it to individuals. Like if you had a kid, you would get let's say 12 yearly scholarships for your child from the government and then you could use it any way you wanted and if public schools were good well then you might uh, a, 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 what it will do would be it will introduce a free market into education a competitive market if public schools are really good obviously most of us would be putting our money into the public schools but if they're not we'd be putting them into alternatives of various kinds might be my free school or it might be giving it to an old man who lives in the mountains, right? To just, just be like a master and just be like a guru to our, to our child. A lot in, the, in, in the adolescent years, a lot of the money might not be spent for institutions at all. It might be spent to send the, send the children to Argentina for a year to learn to speak Spanish, this sort of thing. Um, a lot of things like that. And um, I think that I find the voucher system very interesting, but I don't I have not yet thought through all the, all the dangers. The dangers seem to me, some of the obvious ones are that if we introduce 
this kind of a competitive market, won't, won't the extreme racists in various parts of the country use this as, 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 an, as an out? Won't this be a way of starting tax-supported reactionary schools, right-wing schools? If it's good for the left, it's good for the right, obviously. So that's, that's one thing to think about. And are we willing then to, are we willing then to, I would be willing to opt for that anyway. I think most black people I know would say that the schools could not be more harmful to them than they are already, so it wouldn't be any worse, wouldn't matter. And at least they'd have the freedom to do their thing. But that's one danger. And the other, of course, the answer also is there could be some constitutional limits on how the money was to be used. The second danger is that big business will get into the act. In other words, at present, wha is it, who owns the SRA Corporation? Is that IBM, I think? Yeah. At present, IBM is like, it makes a lot of money indirectly. You might call IBM a subcontractor through the school system for education. But if the voucher scheme goes through, why should IBM settle for a small piece of the pie? Why not start their own schools? They could start IBM schools all over America and compete with us. And they might be able to beat us because they probably have the money to buy off the best talent, right? The big bit. What? Yeah, yeah. Industry is very skillful at buying up radicals and sort of putting them into safe positions. And I, c I could see that happening. You could see, you could see um, Time Incorporated tr trying to get people like Neil Postman, you know, who wrote Teaching a Subversive Activity, or John Holt, or, or any of my other buddies, to, you know, myself, to try to work for them as a consultant and I think I think if that happened, it, I still th I happen to think it would be worth the, ga the the gamble because I I think it would be a real test of the integrity of a lot of people, and I also think that if we really believe in the essential human decency of Americans of any sort, you know, any kind of deep down integrity, then we we oughtn't to be afraid to give people a big choice. What it really means is we we'd be taking a big gamble, and we'd be sort of acting on. Mil John, you know John Milton's challenge in Areopagitica? It's almost the only thing I remember from college. He says, let truth and falsehood grapple. Whoever knew truth put to the worst in a free and open encounter. Well, it's, uh, there's no free and open encounter in the public school system. The voucher system would, in fact, create a real encounter. It would be an interesting challenge. Would we, for example, would a group of us, let's say some of us here, wanted to start our own local free school along lines which, let's say along lines which in pedagogic terms were influenced by Summer Hill and Neil, and in political terms by some of the things that I was saying tonight, let, today, this afternoon. Let's just say it had that, that orientation. Let's say IBM came in and tried to compete with us. The question is, would, would they be able to? Well, I, I think that if we have any faith in ourselves and in the decency of people and just in the value of truth itself, I should think that's a challenge we could take. I would, uh, for, for one thing, the key ingredient in the free school is, is not really the content of the teaching, but it's the psychological fact that the people who are there are the ones who run it, that it's our own place, that we did it. Do you understand what I mean? It creates a different consciousness when you know, it ma doesn't matter how hip it is or how innovative, it's the fact is that we created it ourselves and the kids know it. So nobody has that futile, helpless feeling that this is an amazing, complicated thing. We all think, well, heck, my mother, my mother helped, my mother started that school. Do you see the sort of thing I mean? Or as a teacher, we say, I remember when we were planning it, when we decided where to build it and so forth. So I, I should think that would be a good, I should think that would be a worthy gamble, but there are many people who don't think so. And uh, you know, a lot of people think it's the voucher system is dangerous. Then the other thing, of course, a lot of, I'm t answering your question at too much length, but just quickly, a lot of people are thinking, even if the voucher system doesn't come into law, why don't we create our own sort of radical version of the voucher system and do it like this? Why don't we go into school systems and try, and why don't we go into, I've mentioned this before, why don't we go into a school system like New York City or Boston or Chicago and take kids who have been in school for, 12 for six years, let's say, kids who have sat in school for six years, have had 45 substitute teachers in six years, which is a common phenomenon. Let's say they've had 45 substitute teachers. Let's say they're black kids. They've never yet had a black teacher. Let's say they've never read anything by a black man. Let's say because of all the substitute teachers and the turn-off curriculum that half the kids can't read and the ones who can are reading at fourth grade level, and let's say 
that the building is physically unsound and so forth. And let's say we could test them and by the, it, not in our terms, but in the terms of the system, we could prove that they had been cheated. Do you understand what I mean? Not in our terms, which might be more idealistic terms, but even in hard terms like reading scores and stuff like that and health exams, boring things like that. We could prove that those kids had been screwed. Well, I should think that would make a fascinating legal case, a really good case in court, and this is being talked about. In other words, bring a, like a, a consumer, a, a class suit against the school system for having delivered an imperfect product, for having, having delivered a package that was called education and in fact wasn't. In fact, the package was death, but you called it schooling and you told us we would learn and we didn't learn. And I should think that could be done in very unsentimental terms, in very hard-boiled terms, and I think it's the kind of case it would be really like an, the educational version of what N Ralph Nader is doing. Does this make any sense to you? Now, probably you wouldn't win a case like that in court at first, but I should think enact, forcing an issue like that would educate the public a great deal. I should think it would be a, should think it would be a highly provocative thing to make the public think about what school is really doing. It's possible you might win a case of that sort. And that would be very interesting. If you could sue the school system, essentially, for your child's life, and get them, let's say in New York they spend $1,000 a year per child, and you could sue the school system and say, you didn't deliver, I'm taking my kid out, and I want the $6,000 for the next six years, right? See, with that money, we could really do something. Then, then we create our own thing. The problem now is that all the alternatives are dependent on charity, right? There are, there's a very good alternative in New York City. Some of you may have heard of it called Harlem Prep. Have any of you ever heard of it? So, so I've been there twice, Harlem Prep. And despite the name, it's not, a, um, it's not fancy prep. You know, it sounds kind of fancy. It's, it's very political, very hip, um, but also, it's very good in, in hard terms. Those guys are really good. They learn, they, I, was, I spent two days there with seniors in Harlem Prep, and those kids were red hot. You know, they were really terrific. It would never have happened to them if they'd stayed in the New York public schools. But see, the trouble is that all the places like Harlem Prep now are dependent on charity. Harlem Prep is supported by IBM and TWA and Time Incorporated and places like that. And the question is, how long are those places going to support an alternative school unless it toes the line, right? And, and that's, that's the real question, it seems to me. Yes, go ahead. Uh, how do you qualify for free schools? Well, mm -hmm. it depends where they are. A lot of the black community schools I've seen, the parents being worried about survival for their kids want to make sure that the school gets credentials, right? So they're apt to be more strict about your credentials. In other words, be, they're likely to be more careful that the teachers have their college degrees, even if they're not in education, at least have their bachelor's degree, so that they know the, sc they know the kid won't, you know, they know it'll count. That's the point. You don't want to feel your kid's going to be in trouble. Some of the upper class, sort of, sort of white free schools, country free schools, are probably a little more free about it because they don't feel so much danger since they're usually, you know, their parents are wealthy, so they, they feel they can gamble a little bit more. But if you want to find out about it, the way to do it is to write to um, New Schools Exchange, which is a, new s a magazine. It comes out about five, six times a year. It's an exchange newsletter. And if you're, ever, if you're interested in it, write to them and say who you are, you know. Say, I... I, I um, beautiful, brilliant girl in Iowa, and I want to teach in a free school in the mi in somewhere in this part of the country. And they'll play. They have like cl free classified ads. They'll place the ad, and then they'll, um, you know, they'll they'll pick someone else will write to you, or you'll see an ad in it for someone who's looking for a teacher. Um, and I think that's a good starting point. If you want anyone who wants, if you want to write to me in Boston, um, we've made up a, about a 30-page list of all the places we know that know about free schools. And I hate to, it, it's, I'm ashamed, sorry it's so indirect, but it, what we did is we listed all the clearing houses and things we know about, and it tells you how much they'll charge you, things like that. You know, like if you write to this place and close $5 so you won't to save time, things like that. Uh, also, I think it gives some phone numbers if you want to call them up. There's a place in 
n near Boston called the Teacher Dropout Center at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, which is very good, run by a guy named Len Solo, S-O-L-O. -O. If you wanted, you could probably just write to him directly in Amherst. And there's a, a group in New York now, I was just there a few days ago, they're forming a federation of, of, of uh, free schools, fairly political free schools, free schools who are, who are thinking of in not simply the kind of summer hillian thing, but, but thinking of some of the political struggles also. So if, if anyone's interested, um, s send me a note in Boston. For, and don't, don't be put off if it takes a week or two just to get back to you, because I don't run any fancy office. I just have a couple of young people who help me. And when the mail gets piled up, then we spend an evening and reply to it. <laughs> so um, in my address, if you want it, is 139 West Newton Street. Boston. If you're rich, send us a couple bucks to pay for all the Xeroxing if you're not down. Okay. And it's not a. People are always worrying about ripoffs. It's not that. Yes. 139 West Newton Street. Yeah. In the system, you mean? Yes, I, I generally, first of all, the situ this situation is better now. The situ situation of delivering a lecture in a huge auditorium like this is a little, and about what I'm talking about is a little artificial. It's paradoxical in itself to sort of be preaching the word about the dangers of preaching the word, <laughs> sort of. Um, but so I don't like to pontificate with, with you. Do you know what I mean? I really don't know the answers, but I'm in a way generalizing from my experience and that of a lot of my friends, it seems, it seems legitimate, it makes sense to try to fight the battle in the most important place, which is in the public schools where most of the children are, after all. And uh, if possible, not to go into the hip and fashionable schools like Evanston, Illinois, which is kind of fancy, but to go into the schools where kids come from you know, poor backgrounds, maybe some of you do, I don't know, but to g go into working class backgrounds if possible, I should think that would be the ideal place to try and see what can be done and see, and I don't think it's a matter of going in and being like preaching the word from Malcolm X and from Huey Newton and that kind of thing. I don't think that's so necessary as it is just sort of go in there and by your own personal life the way you are, be sort of conveying a sense of, of a sort of a heightened consciousness of struggle to the children. I think the real hidden curriculum is the, just, is the expression in the teacher's face. You know what I mean? It's just so, the, the teacher who comes, who, a teacher who can talk about some of these things without crying, in a sense, teaches the, 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 the most important and worst lesson of all, which is, which is how to handle pain and not worry about it. You know what I mean? I just mean the teacher's character is the most important, is the thing that's going to make the difference. And you could, uh, and um, that, you know, on, in contrary, so many of the Negro history courses are so terrible, boring, stupid, it would be better not to teach them because you d people are talking about all this stuff that, it as I said, it might just as well be Mickey Mouse because there's no feeling in it. Do you see what I mean? Because uh, all these books are used now. I, mean, I know my books are used all in all high schools, and the kids read it, and they don't see. See, what, what, what's happening is that they read it, and they don't see that it, that it poses them with a challenge. It doesn't, it doesn't get them upset. It's sort of, it doesn't say, like, well, what, could, what are you going to do? Instead, I keep getting letters from high school kids, you know, like class letters, the kind I made fun of before. I get these class letters, and they say, isn't that a shame? W isn't it? must be terrible in Boston. Now, I get letters like that from Chicago, you see. Um, so I think that we should go into those schools and try to survive as long as we can and try to be nice, too. If you're, if you're just a nice person, you know, if you're, sort of, if you're nice and the other teachers like you and you're a good teacher and you're, really the ki you're good with the kids, they probably won't fire you for a while. They'll probably try to roll with the punch and say, well, she'll calm down after a couple of years. Let's, let's keep her around. She'll become more, she'll learn as she becomes more professional. And it's sort of, and maybe it'll last four or five years. And I think, I think that's where we should try. But just, I think then we should know that when we, if we do stick out our neck, let's say a big issue finally comes up. Do you know what I mean? Something happens. Something's forced in the town. Maybe a school busing issue or something maybe deeper than that. Something maybe more, more deep and moving than that. And you really go home and you say to yourself, well, this is it. I've really got to make a choice. You know, I think at that point, it's easier to make the choice and take and stick out your neck 
if you know that there are 2,000 free schools in the country that would like somebody like you. You see, that's why I think that I think we should I think we should go into the system and try to operate there as what I would call sophisticated and polite subversives, and 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 not be nasty. You know, I think there's a way of being very truthful and good without being mean to the other teachers. Do, do you know what I mean? A lot of young radicals think that they have to go in and, and into the teachers' room and and roar at all the at all the all the older teachers. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And sort of make them all frightened. They go into the faculty room where everyone's nibbling their sandwich at lunch and say, power to the people. <laughs> I don't think that's sort of, I think the thing is more to be kind of cool and nice, I mean to be nice so they like you and then sort of, but, but be very true to your beliefs, to your values. Refuse to do any classes on ethical subjects without forcing the ethical issue Right, you know what I mean? Right there. Don't let the system. Don't don't show the children how to handle pain, but to face it. And there's no way to get around racism without white people sitting down and crying <laughs> someday. There's no way to get around it. You can't get it, get through this for free. You know what I mean? And so I think that's the thing. And then and then when you are when and when and then when you're out, either going to one of the schools that already exist or getting together and starting one on your own. Because it, it's a lot of money in public schooling is wasted in administration. That's a big thing in administration and plant. And the money that goes into these spectacular big buildings. Do you know? Do any of you know Evanston? Any of you from Illinois? Evanston High School, spec the biggest building I've ever been in. I think. I guess the Pentagon must be bigger. It's a huge building, huge thing, and it's so much money went into that. And and it just doesn't. It seems to me a terrible thing to do that because. In, but but for us an advantage because it w because you know let's say you had 20, 20 high school kids let's say 14, 15 year old kids and um, or let's say there were a hundred you know a hundred kids and and they you know they they could their parents each a thousand dollars let's say you could let's say they they could each raise somehow two hundred dollars in a year find ways to raise it. How much would that be? About $25,000? Yeah, you know, you run a nice little school for on $25,000 a year for teachers willing to work at a, you know, minimal salary, something like that. Of course, it's easier to do it at the, at the younger level, you, you know, where you don't need to have so many specialists as you do in high school. And it's very easy to, like my wife and I just were buying a, a house in Roxbury where we, we for, for six years we lived in the, I lived, weren't married then, we lived in on the edge of the ghetto, sort of. It's called the South End in Boston. It's like Georgetown in w Washington, where it's just gradually becoming white, sophisticated. And all this time, uh, we, you know, parents kept thinking, well, when he gets married, he'll, you know, they'll move out. So we got married and we, we, we thought we decided to move in. <laughs> We're going we're moving right into the na right more up into Roxbury up on the hill, but we were thinking we might get a, try to get a big kind of a big house there, and we thought maybe in a year or two we start our sc a school right in the house, you know, just start a school, find the two of us together, like take kids from maybe about four years old up to eight. I love to have kids of different ages together. I think it's. I think I can do more. I think they can do more with each other and can teach each other. We think, you know, that'd be fun. We thought we get forty, maybe thirty kids. If thirty parents can come up with, you know, all with about ten thousand dollars, eight thousand dollars, could probably hustle that much money. That's all it would take to live on, and that. So it se seems to me that that the, that the because the free school idea is, is based upon, you know, taking some some sacrifices with salaries and stuff like that. A lot of s free school people are doing a lot of things like buying groceries together. You know, these grocery cooperatives that are starting around the country, where people in a neighborhood, instead of using the local supermarket, will a hundred families will will place orders to together they take turns have you ever heard of this the uh, grocery didn't you ever hear of the great grocery conspiracy in berkeley where they people 
they com nearly put some of the grocery stores out of business by doing this. You know, like somebody comes around and every week takes turns and you rent a truck or something or a station wagon and he goes off to the market and he brings back, you know, a lot of potatoes and meat and lettuce and whatever you need and stuff. And, and they're, do they're doing things like this so they can live much more cheaply. And this really leads to the, you know, the more important point that it's not just a school, but they, the free schools tend to tra transform the lifestyle of the people who are involved with them. It, you know, it sort of changes their lives a great deal. And that, you know, some, you know, an ideal arrangement would be to include in the in the school community a good young, a good young doctor, a good young general practitioner. He gets his schooling for free, and in return, he takes care of. He provide. He's the family doctor for these hundred families. This kind of thing. And this is the way. You know, they they're able, in a way, to live outside the the enormous, you know, sort of scary structure of, of society. You know what I mean? Like the fear. You for most of us, because you, you don't. Most of you younger don't worry about it, but older people do know that if you get sick, how expensive it is and everything, and paying health insurance and stuff like that is terribly expensive, and things like that. So I think that, you know, for, for many people, the free school idea is part of a kind of a whole free lifestyle and <coughs> involves th things like that. And so, some of them live in communes in the country. I don't go for that myself because I don't, I, don't I, I think it's hard for people to, to fight the important battles if they live way out in the country, but I don't know. So should we take a couple more questions? Is Glenn still here? Oh yeah. Do we have time? Okay. Okay, sure. <laughs> you know, I just tell Glenn something. You know the phone call I got earlier when I was all all um I was all concerned. I about about three hours ago I got a call from um uh ABC in New York that when I rush back there tomorrow night for the Cavett, Dick Cavett show. And I, because my, this man I love and admire so much, Ivan Illich, is, is in New York now. Do some of you know of him? Oh, was he? Isn't he wonderful? What a man, huh? Did it go over well? Did, did people baffled by him, or how did they react? Isn't he personally a Interesting man, yeah. Uh, he, he has his book is coming out in, in any day now. That's something worth telling you, I guess. To, uh, it's called Deschooling Society, Deschooling Society, uh, Harper, Harper, the publisher. So he's um, the, the Cavett Show called and asked if I would could come back to New York tomorrow night to be uh, to jo to join in Illich to question him because so instead of Cavett, so I could question him. I thought that would be fun. I was all excited and I called him back and said. I told, first Glenn was there, and I said no, right? Then I called back, and I said yes. And they said, oh, we're sorry, it's tonight. It's tonight's show. <laughs> they, got, they got mixed up in their scheduling. We ought to watch that. That'll be on tomorrow night. Does that come here? What? No, I'm, I won't be there, because <laughs> they're, they're taping it tonight. They're taping it tonight. It'll be on tomorrow night. But I, would wa I, sh I should think that would be something to see. I will watch it, even though my egotism will be deeply shattered by not being there. <laughs> I'll keep saying to myself, well, it would have been better. No, I, I, um, he, he's such a fascinating man. It really just, just it transformed my whole life, meeting him. Uh, what, a, what an interesting guy. Um, yes, this will be the last one, okay? Yeah. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Change society, yeah. Well, I agree with you, in, in particular, to be specific on the subject of indoctrination. School is not the only vehicle. The other major vehicle is, of course, the mass media, is like TV, like precisely, you know, the talk shows, things like that, news. 
ma magazines, Time and Life and all that stuff, and publishers. So it's not exclusively school, but I think uh, it, it's my belief that school can could be more significant lever than any other for this reason, that of all the indoctrinational influences we live with, school is the one that is mandatory. School is the one that everyone has to get by law. It's the only one. Theoretically, al although it's hard, most of us can refuse to turn on the TV set, right? You don't need to watch um, Cavett and all that stuff. You don't need to read Time magazine, but you have to go to school. This is this so it seems to me that it that it's a very significant um, it, it seems to me enormous it seems to me the one and especially because we get to it when we're so young. You see what I mean? It's when we're so little. And often I have the feeling that after children have been in school for about six or eight years, it's almost impossible at that point. You see kids who are seniors in high school, for example. Sometimes it's almost impossible to get them to really to have that ice crack and to have them really get, to have a really strong talk in class. So many of those class discussions in high school are so boring and they're so deadly because it's as though children have learned already that there's nothing to argue about anyway, as though they've already decided that they're never going to make a brave choice in their life and therefore why have a class discussion? Do you know what I mean? Do you teach high school? Well, that's why that seems so important, you know, to fight that battle there. Oh, I see what you mean. You were thinking what I was saying about real confrontations? Oh, well, it seems to me, I made the point, but I made it too fast. I made it in a hurry. Um, it seems to me that it's legitimate for a teacher to say honestly to the kids, look, there are certain ways in which we compromise our ideas. I said it facetiously, but I shouldn't have, really. Um, there are certain ways in which we compromise our convictions in order to survive with one another. And it seems to me on that basis, you, 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 you make it clear that what the classroom is is a modus vivendi. This is just a way of living now with each other. But you don't allow that to, to, to obliterate the fact that there are in life real choices to be made, that you simply cannot be on the side of the man in Venezuela and also on the side of the man who's, uh, who, who is taking his money, that you just have to choose. That's the thing. See, the, I, think, I think that's the thing which enabled the American people to go through the civil rights movement and then go on as though it didn't happen. You know what I mean? Is that most of us sort of just sort of went through it, and we felt, well, it was in that was something interesting that happened. But we don't. I don't have to choose in any way. So, mo an awful lot of civil rights people I know, people like myself, have gone right on and bought homes in segregated suburbs, and they don't see that it applies to them in any way. Well, I should think you could say that in a way. Well, I, but I think what you, I think when you do that, in the, well, first of all, I don't think it would hurt to have some kinds of real hot arguments in class as long as kids aren't hurting each other. And I think that can be handled simply on the basis that it's, for, you know, that, that if you beat each other up, you're going to go to reform school. <laughs> I mean, the, the teacher can't do anything about that. If a kid beats up somebody else, the parents are sure as heck going to be up there and cause trouble. So, I mean, I, th I think that can be handled on that basis. And I should think that you could, you could say to children, just like we say in the free schools to each other, we'll say, look, it's getting too hot. We're giving each other too, we're ha ha too much hassle about these things. Let's just, let's just let's not fight these issues. Let's compromise here. But, but make sure that you know that's what you're doing and don't call that truth. See, what, I'm, what I object to is when school shepherds the kids into the middle and then calls that the truth. That is not honest. Do, do you know? I always used to think of, like, in those old English movies that I used to see in the 1940s, that, like Lassie, the, the sheepdog, would shepherd, and the stray lambs would all be brought back into the middle. You know, I always think that's what, that's what it's like, and I just think that's dishonest. This does not mean we're urging people to kill each other. But, I mean, I think the United States could survive if, if indeed it should survive. <laughs> I think it could survive with a great deal of a great deal more honest confrontation between people who really do and should disagree but aren't admitting it. And maybe if we could have 
passionate verbal confrontations, then we wouldn't have to go out and, 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 and break windows and blow up the buildings. Do you know what I mean? I think a lot of people said if, if the weathermen, remember the weathermen in Chicago, the days of rage? And if the weathermen could have gone home, if Mark, remember Mark Rudd? We spoke of this last night in the car, who was the political leader at Columbia. People said if Mark Rudd could have really gone home and said, because uh, he's the guy I always think of, the, the revolutionary leader at Columbia, and then his mother says, all right, Mark, that's all that, that stuff is fine. Now come home at time for Passover. And he goes home for Passover dinner, and he, and he, and he sits down, he's, and he's thinking, I disagree, but everyone says, Mark's a nice boy. He's, he, was on, he was in the New York Times. Mark's a good boy. He's doing something exciting at Columbia, and they won't admit that they really disagree with each other. You know, he was said if if he could have if he could have sat right there at the table, you know, and slammed his fist and said, "Damn it, I'm against you." You know, if he could have done that, then maybe he wouldn't have had to go and 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 put on a helmet and and um, break the windows of Bonwit Teller. You know, which is an indirect way of getting back at your mother, I guess. <laughs> so we'll. Keep in touch. If some of you write to me, I'd like to keep in contact with you. We'll be here tonight anyway, won't we? Okay. For those of you who may want to continue this, at uh, 6 or a little thereafter, uh, Jonathan is going to be eating in the pine room, uh, probably talking while everybody else eats, I suppose, if he does what I've seen him usually do on those occasions. And then... Uh, We'll continue that conversation for those who want to a little bit later. But for now, uh, I think a 15 or 20-minute break is in order. Those of you who want to come on down to the Pine Room, do so.